Thank you very much for the invitation and, uh, um, and the introduction. I, I, I'm a scientist, and, and, so, and so my perception of timescale is probably longer for, in, uh, from, from what I do to anything useful is maybe longer than some of, what, some of you are used to. But um, I want to talk a little bit about um, where solar might be going in the future. Um, so so I, I, I'm not going to be talking so much short term about the current technology. I'm talking about what's going to be tomorrow's technology. Um, I, I actually hold two hats. I, I, I've got, I, I work here. I also work with a specific centre in Swansea, um, which is more an engineering focused programme. And I'll say a little bit about that as, as part of my, my presentation. So, if, if, of course, the starting point with solar is that in many ways the problem is solved. Um, as solar is boom time. If, if you, um, it, um, I, I, I'm well aware in the UK it may not feel like boom time at the present. The, the, the changes in government subsidy and has, has, has caused some challenges. But, but globally, solar continues to grow at around about 40% a year. The, the largest markets now um, for not just production but for installation are in China and India. Um, and so um, globally, the growth rates for solar continue to be very strong. Um, if, if you take the current growth rates and project going forwards, then sometime towards the end of the next decade, solar will become the dominating source of electrical power in, um, globally. Um, it's already obvious that, uh, of course, it, it's unlikely it will carry on at quite those, those rates of growth. Um, it's, alre it's already apparent that in some parts of the world, um, solar is the cheapest way to generate electrical power. Of course, there's is issues of intermittency I'm going to come to in just a second. And almost all that growth has been driven by making silicon solar cells cheaper. Um, so this is the, the central idea of how you slice up silicon ingots to make um, silicon solar cells. And of course, the Chinese have become um, fantastically expert um, at making cheap silicon solar cells. And that's driving um, that growth in technology. Um, as a scientist, so, so that's fantastic if you want to put up cheap solar cells. Um, it's a challenge as a scientist. What can we do which is new? Um, but, but, uh, of and of course, um, one of the things which is happening is trying to make silicon solar cells better. Um, and, and for example, one of the areas of research in the UK is think, uh, thinking about trying to make tandem cells combining a printable what's a proskite solar cell on top of silicon. That's quite exciting. Um, it may enhance the efficiency of silicon solar cells beyond where they are today. But maybe the biggest thing to realise with, with solar is that um, because the cost of the silicon has come down so much, the cells has come down so much, the cost of the cell is no longer limiting the cost of a system. The cost of a cell is typically only a third of a cost of a system. Most of the cost is putting it up and, um, and the infrastructure and the banister systems all around that. And so if you want to develop new PV technologies which are better than silicon, the obvious thing we have to address are the integration and the banister systems costs. Um, and that's an interesting challenge. We also have to, of course, think about how we store um, the energy, and I'll talk a, li a little bit about the, the topic which Nigel touched on, the, the, the combining um, PV with hydrogen generation and indeed CO2 reduction, um, at the last part of my talk. But uh, in general, there is the, the vision, and that, that's the concept here, the PV of electrolysis, but the idea that you can make PV products which are, are different to silicon and how you can integrate them into a structure and therefore bring down the cost of integration, I think is going to become very important. We understand very well that you can put silicon PV panels out in fields and you can, if you now get in a train or drive in a motor anywhere in the UK, you will find that. If you walk around London, you will see very few P PV panels. And that's partly because it's quite difficult to integrate photovoltaics into our building infrastructure. If you put them on top of roofs, it's much harder to make them the roof or the window. Um, and so I, I'm interested in new technologies which enable that to be possible because that enables you to think about bringing down the costs, not just of what the cell is, but what the system is. Um, and uh, here's two examples. I'll talk a little bit more about that. That's, these are translucent solar cells. Um, it's, a, it's a product coming out of Germany. This is work from my colleagues in Swansea, where this is an um, off-grid um, teaching block in, in, at, at Swansea University, which is powered by a flexible SIGS product. And the interesting thing there was, so that's a, a, a flexible solar cell laminated onto steel. Um, the solar cell itself is far more expensive than silicon. Um, and less efficient than silicon. You wouldn't choose it as a, as a, as a unit alone um, compared to silicon, it seems no, makes no sense. The cost of a building with, powered by those solar cells was cheaper than if you put silicon on because the silicon were, were heavier and therefore the building itself had to be much stronger to support the silicon. And therefore if you think at the building level, you find by going to a new technology, you're able to make products which are cheaper. They also actually look quite attractive. You can't see so well, there's no glass on the roof. We had the, the, um, the, 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 the Prince Charles Trust come round, uh, who's not the most, uh, who's, who's somewhat concerned about the, 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 the vision of buildings. Um, they loved it because they couldn't actually tell it was a solar cell. It, it looked just like a, a typical steel roofing, a painted steel roofing. 
Um, this is a technology which we're now working with, with Tata Cleantech to translate over to, um, to application in India. Um, and we're, we're very excited by that. Um, the vision which a lot of um, the work at Imperial is engaged in, in terms of new technologies, is, about, is around making that transition to new integratable PV products, essentially by printing. So it's, it's the vision that we can, rather than slicing up silicon ingots, we can actually now solution process semiconductors. Um, and a whole range of semiconductors, here's some examples here. And essentially we can print them onto, onto flexible substrates and make things like, like this. This is coming out of a company we're working with in Cambridge, 819. It's, it's a flexible organic solar cell. That allows us to think about making products which are, are going to be, which can touch markets which silicon can't touch. And of course, it would be rather surprising if, silicon, if solar truly becomes one of the dominating source of electrical power globally, if it's all based on one form of product, always between glass, always a silicon solar cell. That, that is not obvious. That's, you, you would hope um, that with all our science and ingenuity, we can start to be more creative in how we can, have, um, we can, we can harness sunlight. Um, and so, for example, here, it is, I have to show a bit of science, because it, well, it's a sort of science. Um, here's an example of a translucent solar cell, which, which was still around 9% efficient, which actually this technology is quite good. It's, it's blue. Actually, architects quite like blue. Um, it, it, it's, it's a popular colour for windows. But it means you can start to imagine photovoltaic, photovoltaic windows in buildings. That's, I think, quite interesting, quite exciting. In terms of office blocks, that would be very exciting in, in London. And you can, need, you can imagine that we can't yet make efficient invisible solar cells. Which, are, which work on the near IR light rather than the visible light. Um, it, it's about getting material, and, and here the key was, it was using materials where the absorption is a band. Um, silicon is black, the absorption essentially absorbs everything um, from 1,000 nanometers right up to the UV. Molecules, and these are polymers, have much narrower absorption bands, so you can tune them to where you want. Here's another example where actually you, you can tune it the other way, you can actually design solar cells where they only absorb the visible. And so they only absorb indoor lighting, and they don't, um, and, and are rather bad at actually absorbing, uh, getting energy out of the sun. Um, in this case, we can now get to efficiencies of flexible cells, rather like like this, which are, which are significantly more than silicon or even gallium arsenide for indoor applications. That's interesting. That's not going to save the planet, but it's interesting for energy harvesting for the, you know, the Internet of Things and all, and, 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 and our move towards um, energy harvesting in buildings. The other thing which I wanted to talk about is, um, is, is, is a different topic, which is, is um, what not Nigel touched on, was how are we going to handle the intermittency associated with, with, with solar power? And of course, the challenge, but as we move towards more PV and indeed more wind, then the issues of storage become increasingly critical. Um, and, and in that context, then it, 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 it's interesting, of course, to realise this is a challenge with plants worked out many millennia ago. Um, where, where, where they worked out how to, to turn sunlight um, and oxygen and, and CO2 and water into hydrocarbons, into sugar. Um, and the, the vision of trying to go beyond that, to, to learn from photosynthesis, to develop what you might call artificial photosynthetic processes, um, is something which is attracting an increasing amount of attention. The, the vision, the, the drivers, of course, are, are, are the challenge of can we have sustainable fuels and chemicals? Can we imagine pathways to getting both to fuel but also to uh, maybe in the shorter term high value chemicals where the energy input is sustainable? Um, can we think about, uh, 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 and this vision of sustainable fuels and chemicals is something which um, the Royal Society of Chemistry has written a report on, and more recently, um, related to that, the Royal Society has had two reports on both CO2 utilisation and green hydrogen, which are both very much part of that story. But the, the, the challenge, of course, is that um, we, we heard from Nigel about the, the importance of batteries, but uh, as he said, batteries are fantastic for short term storage, but their scalability makes them more challenging for long term interseasonal storage. And therefore, if you want to have long term storage, storing energy in chemical bonds is going to be a key issue. Uh, if you want to decarbonise transport, then of course, already we're moving towards electric powered cars, but it's less obvious we're going to move towards electric powered planes and, um, and probably lorries and ships. And so the idea of having a transportation fuel which is sustainable is interesting. And then, of course, is all the chemical input, um, into the, into, uh, uh, sustainable inputs, energy inputs into the ch chemical industry. This, of course, relates to, uh, to another area of science which I think is very exciting, which is around CO2 chemistry. Um, increasingly, chemists are trying to work out, um, can you think of CO2 not as a pollutant, but as a chemical feedstock into the chemical industry and trying to work out how you can use CO2 usefully. Um, they're, they're far more expert people than me trying to do that. So the vision is, is, um, is, 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 is trying to look at pathways for how we can um, input 
sunlight or indeed other renewable energy sources and winds, the obvious other one, um, and try and couple that through either to green hydrogen, as Nigel talked about, or maybe um, in the long term trying to get through to hydrocarbon-based fuels or chemicals. Um, and indeed, there are already many, um, uh, the research in this field is very vibrant, very, very chaotic, actually. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, um, it, it's an area where, where, where there's almost as many ideas as there are researchers working in the area. Um, it's very much based on catalysis, because nearly always, if you want to make chemical bonds, you need to catalyse the formation of those chemical bonds. All of those catalysts are good. In electrolysers, we use platinum and iridium oxide, which aren't two of the cheapest materials in the world to, 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 to drive that catalysis. Clearly, there's an interest in trying to get um, uh, 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 lower-cost catalysts and, and indeed, lower-cost um, systems. And so the research in this field is exciting. It's something we actually Nigel and I started here at Imperial maybe eight years ago, with an artificial leaf project, which, um, which, which, which is, and indeed that's now, as I'll show you, has, uh, has a lot of traction. Um, there's, if there's wider applications, for example, how do we get ammonia from nitrogen? Um, uh, uh, currently, the conversion of nitrogen to ammonia is a key source of, of, um, of CO2 emissions. If, if we can work out how to reduce nitrogen to ammonia electrochemically, then that's fascinating and very exciting. It's also very challenging scientifically, um, and, but, but it's an area of very active research. There are many ways you can think about doing this. The obvious thing you can do is to couple solar cells with electrolyzers. Um, Nigel touched on this. This is an exciting area of research. The, the solar cells already are becoming cheaper, as we talked about. Um, the electrolyzers aren't yet becoming much cheaper, but I think that's an exciting and interesting area of research. And then there's ways people are trying to think about can you integrate materials which absorb sunlight into catalysis. Uh, and, and the simplest concept um, are, are things like this, are, are suspensions of nanoparticles. Um, you could just imagine them in a bag, a, a suspension of nanoparticles or very simple plastic reactors where you shine light on and you bubble off hydrogen and oxygen or you make methane, um, or you make methanol from CO2 reduction. These, uh, essentially, as you go from what is, e which is obviously possible but relatively expensive to what is more challenging but would be cheaper, then the efficiencies go down. Um, a lot of the research is now over here and the, indeed people are now starting to make suspensions like this which start to have efficiencies of a few percent the conversion of sunlight to hydrogen. That's not yet enough to be commercial, but if they can get it up to 10%, the costs will be of the order of, uh, uh, the estimated costs are significantly lower than anything to do with PV plus electrolysis. Um, and that would have a transformative effect on, 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 on it, and it's an area where we're, we're very actively um, engaged in our research. This is just an illustration of the sorts of things we do at Imperial, which I, I, I just would give you some illustration of. I, the, the details don't really matter. Um, so for, for research, this, is a, this challenge of trying to convert sunlight to fuel is highly interdisciplinary. It, it, it goes all the way through from people um, making new materials and thinking about photocatalysis. I think you, 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 you work with Anglia Water, but this is very much related to the area of can we use photocatalysis to clean water. And, 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 and indeed, one of the most interesting areas is to try and take hydrogen um, out of pollutants, out, out, of, out, out of waste, um, uh, 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 organic waste, most obviously, and, and take that hydrogen out um, to, to, to recycle it as something useful, while at the same time destroying the pollutant. That's a very particularly interesting area of research, which maybe has shorter term applications than directly splitting water. Um, then, of course, there's people trying to do modeling of surfaces. They're the electrochemists who are trying to understand how to design reactors. And I actually like to try and do, I measure kinetics. I'm a photochemist, and so I measure how fast things move. In this case, we were trying to work out how we can make hydrogen on one side and then oxidize methanol to methanol on the other side. Methanol turns out to be much more valuable than methanol and seemed to actually to work rather well as, as, as a way of doing things. So that's all I really wanted to say. Um, I will stop with some, there's some of the people who, who, that's my group who does research, and there are lots of people I could have thanked, but um, there's, there's, there's many people um, involved in this field. Uh, PV will be more dominant. I don't think there's any doubt about that globally, but I would hope that it won't all be silicon. Um, maybe even not all, uh, uh, all silicon made in China. Maybe we'll actually start doing something in the UK, or at least ha um, have, some have some technology developed which has UK patents behind it. Um, that would be quite exciting. Um, and I hope that solar cells won't always look black, and they won't always between, be between glass. Um, I, I think that will, may change how we can put solar up. The big challenge, or, or for me a big challenge, is can we develop the chemistry and the, and, and, and the light absorbers to be able to split hydrogen, to, to make hydrogen and, and, and oxygen or, or to reduce CO2 simply from suspensions of particles on a, on a surface or in water. Thank you, James. With that, I'll stop.